Hi folks and welcome to Philosophy According to Eddie and today we're going to have a look at religious language. We're going to be considering the apophatic and the cataphatic way of trying to describe God. The big problem if you're trying to describe God is if God is beyond human comprehension how do you actually describe him it? The very fact that God is beyond our comprehension means surely we're not going to be able to describe him. Well, various thinkers have tried to come up with ways of describing God in a way that, that makes sense and that we can understand, but at the same time doesn't commit the offence of blasphemy, because you don't want to be able to describe God um, in human terms, um, but accidentally, in the process of doing that, suggest that God is um, on the same level as humans. You want to be able to give him a certain amount of, well, we'll say him, you want to be able to give him um, this superiority. You want to be able to say that God is above us and beyond our comprehension, um, but we can still describe him in some way. So you're avoiding the blasphemy of saying that we can completely understand him, but we are trying to describe him in some way. Difficult one to, um, to bring together there. To understand this, we need to go over first what um, cognitive and non-cognitive sentences are. Um, it's a bit of logic and a bit of knowledge that needs to be put into place to understand the apophatic and the cataphatic way. We will be looking at the thoughts of Pseudo Dionysus, of uh, Moses Maimonides. We'll also be looking at Inga, Thea, Aquinas, Tillich, Hugel, Brumer, Ramsey, and Randall as we go through these ideas. So, before we get started, cognitive and non cognitive sentences. A cognitive sentence is one that can be considered true or false. A non-cognitive sentence is one that could not be described accurately as true or false. So an example of a cognitive sentence would be peas are blue. Now it's not true, it's false. But the fact that we can determine whether it's true or false makes the cognitive sen sentence. If you could realistically say to someone that's not true, or that is true, at the end of it, then that is a cognitive sentence. So normally when we're describing things, we use cognitive sentences. For example, here I'm describing peas, even though I'm wrong. Now a non-cognitive sentence would be something along the lines of praise to God. It's a sentence, it makes sense, we know what it means. But if I would say praise to God, and you would say false, it doesn't make any sense, does it? Or, for example, if you smack your foot and you shout, Ow! Ow, as an exclamation, is non-cognitive. If you stubbed your toe and shouted, Ow, or whatever else you might shout, then someone wouldn't come up to you and go, That is correct. It would seem wrong. It would be weird. It wouldn't make logical sense. So, why is it relevant we're talking about cognitive and non-cognitive sentences? Well, both are relevant. Both have relevance in our lives. We understand what both of them mean. But, um, in terms of uh, describing something with meaning, a lot of people would argue that you need to have cognitive sentences to describe something with meaning. For example, um, God is eternal. Now that would be, on the surface of it, a cognitive sentence. We could prove it true or false, but the problem is, can we really prove these sentences about God to be true or false? On the basis that we don't have immediate access to God, then um, how can we prove that God is eternal, or God is all-loving? These seemingly cognitive sentences actually 
you could argue, are non-cognitive because you can't prove them true or false. So we're in a difficult situation. How do we make statements about God that can be proven true and can be cognitive and therefore have got some sort of meaning so we're not just saying essentially praise to God, we're saying God is this, God is that. So that's what we're going to be looking at. The via uh, negativa, the via positiva, otherwise known as the apophatic and cataphatic ways, attempt to find a way of discussing God in a cognitive, meaningful way, in a way that can be proven, but in a way that doesn't commit blasphemy. The first option for talking about God is the apophatic way, or the via negativa. And this suggests we can't talk about what God is, because God is beyond our minds, uh, beyond our comprehension. What we can do is we can say what God is not. So God is not selfish. God is not human. God is not restricted um, by our laws and our time. And this is linked to the idea of God being ineffable, the idea that William James came up with, which you'll have seen in the religious experience video. Now, Pseudo Dionysus was the first to really mention this in any serious way. Um, although it had been part, well, I say in any serious way, in any um, extended way, I should say. It had been mentioned seriously in the Eastern Church up to that point, but he wrote it down. So God is far beyond our poor attempts to describe him, essentially. So if we say God is light, it's not really suitable because it's human language, it's vague. Um, so it's much better instead to use our human language to say what God is not and leave the massive expanse of what God is to fill up the bit that we haven't described. And uh, as I said, this is a very strong view in the Eastern Church. You come across it in Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox Church in particular. Um, and Rabbi uh, Maimonides also added to this, uh, built on these ideas, and suggested that the Via Negativa avoids the risk of anthropomorphizing God, or suggesting that God is like human, basically bringing God down to the level of humans. Um, because if we're describing God using human words, we're dragging his um, extreme power and um, indescribable nature down to a human term. Just the fact that we're calling God, God, and using, I'm using the term him um, at this point, is using human language. So in Jewish tradition, for example, God is actually written as G-D. Um, because that way you're not using a word to describe God. Anyway, descriptions in the scripture, in the Bible, are metaphorical, or should be seen as metaphorical. Um, so when talking about at God's right hand, that's not a true description, that's trying to imply to us um, in a way that we can understand what God is. Although this is a bit more linked to Aquinas' idea of analogy, which comes later in the video. But basically, we can only truly say what God is not. Anything else is just a description, a metaphor. Now, Aquinas responded to this by saying, if we can say what God is not, then surely, logically, that leads us in some way to be able to say what God is. And this draws us into our criticisms. The key criticisms are from W.R. Inger, which suggests that this is risking annihilating God by using the via negativa. Um, you are essentially, by not being willing to describe him, you are severing the link between God and humanity. You are essentially reducing our understanding of what God is, artificially reducing it. We have some ideas of what God is, but we're artificially reducing it and breaking the link between us and God. Now, um, Teilhard, French uh, paleontologist and philosopher, suggested um, that we can positively talk about God's relations with us. So the idea of love, for example, we can describe God's love um, because 
Even if we can't describe it because it's ineffable, we can describe that God is loving because we can feel the love. And any feeling of love is so transcendent that we can get a hint of what God is like from it. So the Dea Negativa, it's, it's good in a technical sense. It avoids us uh, blaspheming against God, reducing God's status, but it doesn't go very far. It's very cautious. It, um, it stops short of taking perhaps bigger, bolder steps that would allow us to know God more effectively. It stays within the realm of the cognitive sentence, which is a big strength. You know, it, it's, uh, in, at least in theory, God is not human. Can we prove that? Well, mm, it's hard to prove, but it's probably easier to prove than saying God is this. So it's more cautious. Technically, the sentences still aren't cognitive, but they're closer to being cognitive. Unfortunately, the only way that the sentences can be cognitive is if we were to meet God, and theoretically, according to Christianity, that happens when we die. Nobody's come back from the dead yet. Um, if you exclude Jesus, if you believe that. So, the via negativa overall has got strength since it's cautious and r doesn't risk offending God, but big weakness is it doesn't tell us very much. For this, we need to have a look at the Via Positiva. So we've looked at the apophatic way and there were problems with it. Let's now have a look at the cataphatic way or the Via Positiva. Now this suggests um, that in fact you can say positive things about God. God is this. God is that. When we say positive and negative we don't mean um, God is good versus God is bad. That's not it. It's whether you can positively say this is what God is, or you negatively say, this is what God isn't. So, what can we poss positively say? Um, well, Aquinas, Augustine, and Anselm all say that positive things can be said about God, as does W.R. Inge. So how do we speak of God positively? God is this, or is that? We can use a description from the scripture, so the scriptures do give positive descriptions of God. We can give descriptions from experience. So as we experience love, we can say, well, that must be from God. God is love, etc. Although, again, if not done carefully, it risks anthropomorphism. There's also, as well, on top of this, the use of analogy and symbol. Now, analogy and symbol are... Um, a stage on from the um, specific cataphatic way. It's not just saying positive things about God, it's a different way of saying positive things about God, but they still count as being apophatic. Uh, cataphatic, sorry, they still count as being cataphatic, um, although they are, as I say, a stage on from uh, descriptions from the scripture or from experience. Now, analogy and symbol are good because um, they tell us what God is like rather than what God is. So it gets rid of that risk of anthropomorphism. Maybe not quite as specific as either of these two options, but it does at least provide um, a way of understanding God that doesn't say that God is like humans. And this brings us a bit closer to making true cognitive statements. Um, you know, ones that can be proven true or false. The problem with analogy and symbol is that they aren't um, literally true, um, but you can at least look, to, you can say, could this be true, could this be false? Descriptions from scripture and experience are a little more linguistically cognitive, but when it comes to trying to prove whether they're true or not, they become more difficult. So, cataphatic way, we're thinking Aquinas, we're thinking Inga, Augustine, and some in particular. But we're going to have a look a little bit closer now at analogy, which is another of Aquinas' ideas, and symbol, which is Paul Tillich's idea. Analogy is something that was first suggested by Aristotle, but Aquinas developed with regard to um, religious language 
in terms of a way of describing something, um, going from an, uh, a known idea to an unknown idea. So the whole point of an analogy is to use what we're familiar with to understand the unfamiliar. So Aristotle's criteria, okay, criteria are that there needs to be uh, the right number of similarities, the more the better, within the analogy between the thing you know and the thing you don't know. There should be an, enough identical properties or relationships within an analogy. And there should be common principles at work as well. So, for example, if I were to suggest that a dog is like a spade, we're struggling here. How many similarities are there between uh, a dog and a spade? How many identical proportion, uh, properties or relationships? Not many. Maybe they can both dig. And how many common principles? Again, not many. Whereas, um, if I were to say um, a, a JCB digger is kind of like a spade, well, they both move earth, they've both got blades, they're both operated by people, so it can make a bit more sense, particularly if I say it's like um, a spade on a stick that you can move. You see how an analogy builds up. Um, and you can then move on to, to, well, that's more like a description, but then you can move from that onto analogies um, such as um, human life is like a day. Morning, middle, evening, that kind of idea. Anyway, that's an analogy. Um, but the point that um, Aquinas wanted to get across is that when you use an analogy, you use analogical language rather than univocal or equivocal language. As a side point, univocal words have got one meaning, equivocal words have got two meanings. So like bat could be a little creature or it could be something that you play cricket with. So analogical language allows us to use human language in a way that can describe God without suggesting that we truly know what God is like seems to get around the problem of how to describe God in a positive way. And he's got two aspects. This is analogy um, of attribution and analogy of proportion. Now, analogy of attribution is the idea that we can know God from God's creation, even if we don't know God's exact traits. So, um, in the same way that, for example, um, if I were to give a blood sample, that blood sample could be checked, and people could go, yep, that's healthy. Therefore, if the blood is healthy, the person must be healthy. Now, they're not suggesting that I am just like one giant bag of blood, um, but they can tell, because the blood is healthy, I am healthy. So, from God's creation, God has created a beautiful creation, uh, God has created the world in which there's love, therefore God must be loving, God must be intelligent. All these things that particularly come from the arguments from experience in year one philosophy. But there's also the analogy of proportion. The analogy of proportion is that if you can relate something that is uh, one level to something that's slightly bigger, you can then link that bigger thing to something that you've never seen before. Now that may sound a bit confusing, but imagine, for example, if, um, again, if I were trying to describe a spade, if I say, well, if you imagine what a teaspoon is like to a, a ladle or a cooking spoon, that is what uh, a spade is like to the cooking spoon. So the teaspoon is very small, the ladle is much bigger, so imagine that, that same relationship, that same proportionality to get to the spade. So use of carrying on that relationship. And Baron von Hugel gave a very good um, explanation of this and said, um, essentially said that uh, if you imagine what a dog is like to a human, a human is like that to God. So the dog can't understand us um, in any complicated way. It knows that we're there and 
It must have some idea that we care for it and that we own it and that sort of thing, but in a very basic way. So, people can know that God cares about us and looks after us, but we can't understand God. So that's the proportionality. So God, so dog to human, is the same sort of um, upward growth as human to God. So a lot of strengths here because it suggests well we can't know what God's like, but we can understand the pattern, the trajectory. And we can look at God's attributes and think, okay, so if we scale up all those attributes, we'll get to approximately what God is like. Now, Brumer suggests that this isn't really very helpful at all. Analogy isn't actually telling us anything new. It's really just uh, another way of saying what God isn't. Because if God is fundamentally unknowable, and you have to describe him through analogy, well, you're still really, all that you're saying is, we don't know God. Uh, but God is not like a human, God is better than that. You're essentially just saying that. Um, Ian Ramsey responded to this by suggesting, no, you can know things um, from analogy. And he gave two examples. He gave the disclosure situation, suggesting how analogies can lead you to the real thing. Imagine a triangle, then a square, then a hexagon, then an octagon. The more you look at these shapes, the more you start to see a circle forming. Because you're going from one, the triangle, to the square, and onward, and it becomes more and more round, so you're seeing a circle developing. Even if these shapes still have sides, we never get the perfect curve, but we can see it in our mind's eye. And Ramsey suggested the same with God. If we can create the analogies, we can sort of see where we're going with this. We can see the circle, which is God, in the line shapes that are our world. And they also suggest that human language is a qualified model. So what do we mean by that? Well, we could make, say, if we're testing uh, an aeroplane, we could make a little model, put it in the wind tunnel to see whether the wind moved over it correctly, or we might make a model building see if it, and put it on a, an earthquake simulator to see whether it would survive. And then that would tell us the real thing is going to be all right. Well, human language is essentially a, a model that works for modelling what God is like. So we can use human language um, as a model for understanding God, even if we can't truly describe God. The Bath suggests that God is completely unknowable without revelation through the scripture, that essentially all these human words, they're just no use. So we can't know them at all. Uh, but he is a very much a believer in revealed theology, as you'll know from the Year One Religion Unit. So it's difficult uh, to argue with that on his terms. You'd have to essentially say that revelation isn't all that you need. Now finally, Frederick Ferre came up with quite a nice uh, link back in a sense to Aquinas and natural law by saying um, that when we're looking at these words, uh, yeah, the words aren't enough, but we have to, we, do, we shouldn't just use the words themselves, we should look at the principle of the words. What's meant by the principle of the word God is love, and we can love? We have to think not just about the word itself, and going, oh, well, words are made by humans, so we can't understand anything. We need to think about what the words represent, what they mean as a principle, much like the yus and the lex in natural law. So if we follow the principle of the words, we're more likely to find uh, that link within the analogy to God. Finally, we have the idea of symbology. Now, Paul Tillich talks about symbols as being um, a sign, i.e. something that points to something. So it's a sign that points to meaning and is part of the meaning. It participates in the meaning. So what do we mean by that? Well. If you imagine something like a flag, um, that is a symbol. It's not just pointing to a nation or a group of people, but each time the flag is used, it 
participates. It is part of those people. It reinforces them and it adds meaning back. Um, the United States flag, for example, when it's draped over, uh, over coffins of returning soldiers as a sign of respect to say, this is our nation, this is who we are. In a more sinister sense, the Nazi flag, the symbol of um, all the ideals of Nazism, is still used and still, um, in some small groups of people, um, symbolises the, the hatred and the terrible ideas of Nazism and reinforces them. So it, by holding that flag, it participates in this meaning of Nazism. So, religious language, though, symbolises God. And so, therefore, the, when we use language about God, and not only is it pointing to what God is like, but it's also becoming a part of, of God as well. It's being a part of our understanding of God and ourselves as believers. If we're taking that, to, that viewpoint... Lots of criticisms, though, towards symbology and symbolism. Firstly, what is participation? Tillich doesn't really explain. He, doesn't, he says this idea that it's, uh, participation is being part of the meaning, but doesn't expand very far on it, um, which isn't very satisfying. It does lead us to ask, is there anything more to this symbology than just analogy? You know, it's, it, are symbols more than... So, or is religious language as a symbol any more than analogy if we can't define participation? And also, can language participate in what God is actually like? Is it physically possible? John Hick doubts this and suggests if you came up with the wrong symbol for God, does that start to participate in God and make God turn into the thing that you got wrong? How does that work? It doesn't make any sense. But the big criticism, possibly the strongest criticism in my view, is that symbols can exist purely in the mind. A good example of this is the Confederate United States flag. There was never a confederacy. It was an ideal, it was something people wanted to happen, but it never existed. Yet the Confederate flag still represents this, quote unquote, ideal idea of um, southern states of America. But it doesn't exist. It never exists. It only exists in the minds of the people who fly that flag. So does that mean that God could potentially not exist based on this idea of symbology? This is a problem. Tillich unwittingly seems to be suggesting that God could not exist or only exist in the mind. An alternative approach to symbology, though, is that of Randall, who suggests that symbols can be non-cognitive. I mean, all of this is suggesting that, that the idea of cognitive religious language statements, statements that are true or false, and trying to work out whether they're true or false. But what if religious language is non-cognitive? Is there a problem? Well, if we think about, for example, music. Music is non-cognitive. Poetry is non-cognitive. Fiction writing is non-cognitive because it makes no sense to ask whether it's true or false. It just doesn't work. Um, you know, this poem is false. It doesn't make any sense. So, if we consider this idea of God being a non-cognitive approach in the same way as take music or poetry, something that makes us feel strongly, something that is part of us, then the symbols can be non-cognitive. Problem is then, we come back to the age-old idea of, well, can you prove God to be true or false? It doesn't help with that. But it's an interesting alternative anyway. And it does lead us on to the issue of the cognitive-non-cognitive -cognitive dichotomy. The final issue here is that of the cognitive-non-cognitive -cognitive split. Does it matter? if statements are non-cognitive. The thing is that truth can be found in the non-cognitive, in poems, in stories, in metaphorical stories. So, for example, Shakespeare's sonnets, maybe Genesis, which Origen himself suggested should be taken figuratively. 
It makes no sense to refer to these as being true or false in a literal sense, but we can find truth about human nature, about greater ideas through this non-cognitive medium. Now, people like Dawkins always want to take the Bible and treat it cognitively and say, no, this is false. It's either true or it's false, and it's false. But it's much harder to argue against it if you consider it to be a different form of truth, a non-cognitive truth. So, within all of this, the caveat to the whole thing is if we're trying to use religious language, why not use it non-cognitively? Why not use, for example, a more uh, non-cognitive via positiva or via negativa to try to explain what God is or isn't like. So there you have it. We've had a look at the via positiva and the via negativa. We looked at, in the via negativa, the idea of saying what God isn't um, in order to imply what God is. And the fact it's a cautious approach, avoids blasphemy, but doesn't really tell us very much about what God is. We've also looked at the via positiva including analogy and symbol, which try to tell us more about what God actually is, um, although we ran into some difficulties there, particularly trying to work out what can truly be known. And finally, we had a look at the idea of the non-cognitive truth, the idea that maybe you can make statements about God which are figurative, when we use religious language, and that that's fine. Anyway, with all of this, as usual, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, thanks for watching and see you next time.